Paula and Lindsay Holmes Rodman. Paula Holmes Rodman is an ethnographer, caregiver, advocate, and writer. Lindsay Holmes is a four-year ovarian cancer survivor, a recent brain tumor survivor, and an adult on the autism spectrum. Their presentation today is entitled, A New Self-Advocacy Guide for Cancer Patients on the Autism Spectrum. Meet the sisters who created it. People on the autism spectrum might need specific supports and resources as they navigate cancer. Two sisters, one a cancer survivor who is also on the autism spectrum, and the other an ethnographer and caregiver, have created a self-advocacy guide for cancer patients on the autism spectrum. We hope that our guide will help you and your support people access the best health care possible, have effective conversations with your healthcare team, and learn ways to articulate your needs. Conférencière 2, Paula et Lindsay Holmes Rodman. Paula Holmes Rodman est ethnographe, proche aidante, défenseur et écrivaine. Lindsay Holmes a survécu à un cancer de l'ovaire pendant quatre ans, a récemment survécu à une tumeur cérébrale et est une adulte autiste. Un nouveau guide de défense des intérêts pour les patients et patientes de cancer sur le spectre de l'autisme rencontrer les sœurs qui l'ont créé. Les personnes autistes pourraient avoir besoin d'appui et de ressources spécifiques pour les aider à naviguer le cancer. Deux sœurs, l'une, une survivante du cancer qui est également autiste, et l'autre, une ethnographe et proche aidante, ont créé un guide de défense des intérêts pour les patients et patientes de cancer sur le spectre de l'autisme. Nous espérons que notre guide vous aidera, vous et les personnes qui vous appuient, à accéder aux meilleurs soins de santé possibles, à avoir des conversations efficaces avec votre équipe de soins de la santé et à apprendre comment articuler vos besoins. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about her, her, her experience and her self-advocacy guide for cancer patients on the autism spectrum. I'm a four-year cat, ovarian. Four-year ovarian cancer survivor, a recent brain tumor survivor, and I'm an adult on the autism spectrum. I live with my husband and our four cats in Calgary, Alberta. I'm Paula. I'm Lindsay's sister. I'm not autistic. I'm an ethnographer, caregiver, advocate, and writer. I also study narrative medicine. I live with my husband and two cats on Vancouver Island. Together, we two sisters have created a self-advocacy guide for cancer patients on the autism spectrum. The guide has its origins with Lindsay's experience as a patient and mine as a support person but it is our hope that it will be useful for other ca cancer patients on the autism spectrum and their support people. We hope that our guide will be helpful, uh, will help you achieve three main goals. The first is to achieve the best healthcare possible. The second is to have effective conversations with your healthcare team. And the third is to learn ways to articulate your needs and advocate for yourself in the midst of a cancer experience. Our self-advocacy guide for cancer patients on the autism spectrum provides you with tools to answer the big picture questions. What do you want your healthcare team to know about you that may, they might not know from looking at your chart? There's a fair bit. <laughs> um, you are, and your cancer is so much more than your scans, test results, blood work, surgery notes, and discharge summaries. Our guide provides a series of detailed questions divided into the 10 Ps. The 10 Ps are patient, place, personnel, product or platform, pace, processing, physical or sensory supports, preparation, planning, predictability, proxies or support people, and patients. We'll tell you more about each of these in a bit. But first, an origin story. It's 2019 in the Tom Baker Cancer Center in the noisy basement of the Foothills Hospital in Calgary, Alberta. Just before COVID hits, Lindsay had just been diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer. I took the nurse aside before her appointment and said, my sister's on the autism spectrum. She might need a little help. 
but I didn't know what I was asking for. I didn't know if that information was ever transmitted, to whom, or what if anything came of it. And when it came time for surgery, our aunt, a retired nurse in the same hospital, asked for and was granted some extras. I could stay with Lindsay right up until the moment of surgery and immediately afterward because of her autism. But these were asides and ins and favors. And upon reflection, both Lindsay and I realized that we wanted cancer care to change for people on the autism spectrum. So I did my thing. And I conducted two two hour long inter ethnographic interviews with Lindsay one year apart uh, about her cancer experiences as a person on the autism spectrum. And from that, plus a whole lot of really distressing research about the state of uh, resources, the lack of resources, the guide was born. So first a little disclaimer and a whole lot of roundabout. <laughs> uh, we thought the guide was complete and we thought the story was over. But then Lindsay's cancer returned. So we found ourselves consulting our own guide and reminding ourselves of our own lessons in the midst of what Lindsay called autistic hell. We recently just spent 10 days in the acute neurosurgery unit following the removal of a five centimeter brain tumor. I flew to Calgary to be by her side and slept in her hospital room, but I could do nothing about the constant bells, alarms, neuro checks, staff switches, fractured routines, the most serious of life-changing, fast-moving facts, and a healthcare system that did not seem to know what the right hand, the left hand were doing. And she was feeling perfectly dreadful to be understatement <laughs> of the year. Yep. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, she, after surgery, she has a new visual reality to get used to new tremors, new medications, and of co course, post-surgical pain. Despite all my organizational abilities, and it's kind of my superpower, uh, <laughs> note-taking, advocating, taking over the patient board, I wrote in green marker, Lindsay's autistic, allow extra time, check understanding, support sensory needs. Despite all of that, despite all my insisting, that every single healthcare professional knew she was autistic and I wasn't going anywhere. Well, autistic help. Yep. And she <laughs> and we are still in the middle of it. As we wait for oncology appointments and treatment plans and options next week. So now, as we prepare this presentation, we are relearning from our own guide, revisiting our own best advice. Mm -hmm. And we can share some of the ideas of the 10 P's with you. So the first the first P, I, I think, is the most important, and that's the patient. That's you or me. And some questions we have are, how do you self-identify? Um, how do you want others to refer to you? Words matter. For example, I would say, please call me Lindsay. I'm an adult with autism. Or my name is Taylor. My pronouns are they and them. I'm autistic. What is important to you? What are your interests? Matter even more when we're under gigantic, gigantic amounts of stress. That works for us. We, we, do, we need our dose of cute and Paula has a new kitten. <laughs> How do you define a good quality of life? We're all about patient focused care here. So this means that you get to define what a meaningful and good life is for yourself. Have you success? How have you successfully dealt with difficult or challenging times? What are your coping skills? The second P is place. This is a hospital or clinic. Now, these are not changeable things. So that means we as human beings, unfortunately, have to change ourselves. So, for example, do you prefer a quiet space or one with dim lights to wait for your appointments or treatments? What if one is not available? How do you respond to new environments? What helps? What doesn't? How would you like to get to know your healthcare facility? Would you like an orientation appointment, perhaps a prior to radiation or chemotherapy? And how can you ask for this? And how can you make yourself more comfortable in waiting rooms, in an emergency room, 
during chemo or radiation. Consider um, an idea for a comfort go bag. Lindsay and I have lots of ideas. And just like here on the West Coast, when we prepare for the big one, the earthquake, we suggest you pack a comfort go bag and keep it by your front door. It helped a lot during chemo. <laughs> So the third P is personnel. That's your healthcare providers. Again, very important. So who's on your healthcare team? Who are the players and what are their roles? Are there support groups and patient navigators available? Do members of your healthcare team understand neurodiversity, autism, or other issues that are important to you? Your care. Please check this out. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is often no. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're starting to learn about it. But yeah. If you use alternative augmentative communication, tech, AAC technology, do the members of your healthcare team understand how to communicate with an AAC user or, or do they need training? The fourth one is products and platforms or how you communicate. What are your preferred communication methods and tools? For example, do you communicate do you prefer to communicate in person, on the phone, or via email when making appointments, getting test results, describing symptoms, or following up after treatments? And how do you like to receive new information about diagnoses and treatments? Do you like to read brochures or booklets, watch videos, see things on the internet, and please use trusted resources only? Um, or have conversations. Also, do you like to record your appointments or perhaps have somebody who you trust to take notes and then provide you with those notes? Lindsay and I have a system of, <laughs> of it's kind of it's our thing now. Unfortunately, yeah. we're really good at it. Of questions, I participate virtually. If I can't attend in person, I keep notes and then I, I give the notes to her and then we share them with whatever family members Lindsay chooses to do that with. That means that Lindsay has only to focus on it and then I can take notes. So there's ways of working around this and we suggest that you work out your own system. And finally under this is how can you tell your healthcare team how you are feeling? What words, images, lists, diagrams, pictures, charts, or pain scales might help you express your symptoms, concerns, and experiences? You might be given a pain scale or a checklist after chemo or surgery. How can these best be adapted for your abilities, experiences, and needs? And the fifth, fifth P is pace. The brr, brr, brr. <laughs> That's a doctor going through <laughs> problem. And the, the speed at which the doctors move may not be yours. It certainly isn't mine. And... I think it's part of assertiveness to say, I need longer, please slow down. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's, so some questions we have here, do you prefer plain language and direct re descriptions when discussing di diagnosis or treatment options? When learning about your illness and making treatment decisions, do you like to know all the possibilities at once or a little bit at a time and then make your decisions step-by-step? -step? Um, during your appointments, do you need your healthcare team to slow down? <laughs> I certainly do. Or skip some parts. Can you ask for a longer appointment? How can you make your, these needs known? I'm working on it. <laughs> can you practice, write, or record a script? The sixth one is P for processing. This is the blue donut situation that we all have going on our computer. This is the circle that goes round and round. And for all of us, it goes at different speeds. And sometimes in a cancer situation, it just stops. Mine did. <laughs> yeah, it sometimes does. So that's okay. Um, so what helps you understand or process new ideas, especially medical ideas? We encourage you to think about auditory issues here. Uh, are they... A, a problem for you, perhaps? What about telehealth options? Are they better or worse? Uh, and can you or should you? Is it better for you to ask for in-person appointments? Also, uh, during your appointment procedure or hospital stay, do you need your healthcare team to check in with your understanding about what your treatment plan is or your options are? Lindsay yes. and I call this the yep, yep, yep response. 
-hmm. So for example, a, a doctor or surgeon will come in and speak to Lindsay. Lindsay will going, yep, yep, yep. And I can tell that the blue <laughs> donut is not circling at all. And then the doctor exits the room, end of conversation. So yeah. can we articulate saying, excuse me, I'm not processing there. I need, I need you to check in with me and see what's going on. That's what I need to do. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> and so to that end, how can you let your healthcare team know that you are in the process of understanding or communicating? For example, you do not want your healthcare team to misinterpret periods of quiet situational mutism or uh, minimal eye contact. Uh, so give your healthcare team an appropriate interpretive framework here. I'm thinking, I'm hearing, I'm listening. I'm just not doing what you think I should be doing. Uh, also related to processing are issues of decision-making and consent. Very important. How do you make important decisions? Do you prefer a little more time? How can you ask for them? Do you need a time frame for decision-making? Can I have an extra day, a week? Will it affect my cancer care? What if you need to make an emergency decision? How can you prepare for that? And again, processing does have a lot to do with consent. How do you express your consent? Does anyone help or support you with decision-making and consent? Is there someone who you do not want to help you or support you with decision-making or consent? Please, 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 please think of these things in advance. The seventh P is physical and sensory supports. Do you require any physical supports or accommodations during your appointments, treatments, or hospital stays? This includes ensuring that AAC users can ensure that their devices stay with them. Could also include earbuds. Got me some sleep in the hospital, yes. Um, noise canceling earphones and sunglasses. You express yourself physically with stimming. How can you tell your healthcare team about the ways you self-regulate? Again, provide an interpreter framework here. Have you experienced and expressed discomfort, pain, or distress? Or how have you experienced ex uh, and expressed discomfort, pain, or distress in the past? Have you ever struggled to articulate sensations? For example, underrepresent pain. I'm working on it. <laughs> If you have experienced trauma or assault, how can your healthcare providers ensure that you feel safe and supported during your cancer treatment? Cancer and its treatments can be uncomfortable <laughs> and cause changes to our physical bodies. Yes, indeed. <laughs> These are the understatements of the whole yeah, thing. So. Understatement of the century. Yeah. Do you have any concerns about how you might experience or express these changes? For example, extra support during hair loss wigs, itching, changes in tastes and smells. Could you go in an autism-informed salon or spa? Sign me up! <laughs> <laughs> and can we invent those while we're at it as well? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's do that too. Yeah. And number eight is preparation, planning, and predictability. Understatement number 25, cancer rocks our routines. So how can your healthcare team help you with what to expect? We know that there are things that have brought you comfort in the past when your routines have been challenged and the unexpected has happened, even if it hasn't been cancer. So those skills and abilities you can draw on again in a cancer experience. The other thing in this issue, you can ask if your procedures could be adapted to manage pain or anxiety if these are specific concerns for you. For example, um, maybe there's a quieter space you can wait. Uh, perhaps there's an anxiety medication you can take for a really noisy MRI. Or uh, I asked if I could go with Lindsay to an MRI and actually the answer was yes, but somebody has to ask actually. Um, sometimes it's helpful if you see or learn about a new piece of medical equipment or a procedure in advance. And perhaps you want your healthcare team to ask permission before they touch you. That's okay too. Again, that, that toolkit of, of comfort go bag items helps a lot with uh, predictability and planning as well. We also urge you to consider what else in your life might, might be disrupted as you navigate cancer. Can you prearrange meals, arrange to consider your, uh, arrange to speak to your employer if you have one? 
cons consider speaking to a financial advisor or arrange for the care of children or pets. And finally, we encourage you to connect to other members of your healthcare team if you have any pre-existing or co-occurring conditions. For example, if you have a family doctor or a therapist who's helping you with panic attacks or epilepsy, for example, please loop that doctor into your oncology team. Do not assume that these people talk to each other because what have we learned? They, they do, do not. not. <laughs> <laughs> it's through you. Through you. <laughs> it's through you. Yep. And so the, the ninth P is proxies or support people. Extraordinarily important. Um, do you have who and what you need for at-home support, whether it's after surgery, during chemotherapy, radiation, or other treatments? These are the people and services who can monitor your health and ensure ongoing care at home. Can your support person accompany you in person for your surgery treatments or appointments? And if not, can they attend virtually? We did that a fair bit during COVID. Um, how are you and your healthcare team going to facilitate their virtual attendance? It's a good idea to sort this out in advance as hospital basements don't always have self-coverage. <laughs> no, they do not. No. What role will your pro proxies play during appointments? And how can you ensure that your healthcare team is speaking to you and not just to your proxies or support people? And how have you made important or difficult decisions in the past? What helps you? What doesn't? And finally, the last P is for patience. How can you ask your healthcare team to be patient with you? And how can you be patient with them, particularly in a really squishy healthcare system, <laughs> which is actually the technical term for that? Yep. And most importantly, how can you be patient with yourself? What kinds of self-talk or feedback can you use to make sure that you're not being hard on yourself, uh, that you are being at least as kind to yourself as you would be to someone, a stranger, let alone someone you love. And Lindsay and I have the Egbert answer. Egbert <laughs> is the name of her tumor, which a sweet friend of ours named one light. It was kind of a little bit fueled by codeine and a lack of sleep. Um, and so when she gets frustrated with the, I should, I should be, I, maybe I should, if I just try harder, the answer is Egbert. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that's our code word, our kind of like funny but not funny joke of let's be more gentle with ourselves. Let's be more patient with ourselves. So what can you do the small things to take care of the rest of you? Are there routines? Is there more time alone, time with people you love, pets, places? What are the things that bring you comfort and happiness? And we really encourage you to not let go of all the other things that make you you while you navigate cancer. That's really important. Yeah. Super important. Anyway, um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of this and wish you well on your journey. Thank Bye. you so <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity.